anyway, my name, hmm. all yours. Nice. Mate. Okay. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, yeah. So this talk's going to be on character archetypes. Uh, during the presentation, uh, feel free to use the chat box to ask questions, or you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, or raise your hand, even the yellow one. Mark will prod me if I miss a question. Uh, at the moment, obviously, I've got both screens covered, so I can't see your beautiful faces. But uh, I will uh, I will see if I can actually make this a bit smaller. Okay. I don't think I can. Right, OK, it's my third presentation of the club. As Mark said, I've done one on stories, uh, the basics of stories, and then I've done and the second one was on the hero's journey. OK, let's get going. So here's the format of uh, tonight. Should be finished about 9 to 9.30. So we'll have some time for general discussion afterwards. But the format of my talk is going to be, what is a character archetype? How did they emerge and what examples do we have? And how can they help us tell stories? We'll have a break after slide 21. Um, timing should be about right for that. The clips, the video clips I'm going to sh show are short. Mm. Um, the resolution, resolution will be average, and if, but if it's poor for you, don't worry, it won't last long. Um, I think if Mark's able to, he might send put the zip file in the chat box if you want to sort of watch the videos in higher quality in the break or as we go along. But it's a large file, so it might take quite a while to upload and then for you to download. Okay, so here we go. In my previous talks, I talked about stories being as old as human civilization. And that successful stories tend to have common formats and that most stories follow the hero's journey. We said that we discussed how stories have uh, been around as early as the, some of the cave paintings, all the way through to the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, and out through books, plays, cinema, and television. Even adverts, you know, use story structure. In the first talk, we discussed the principles of story focused on Aristotle's pr principles, that a story has a beginning, middle, and end, your main character, the protagonist, has something they want and something they need. What they want is clear and external, a prize, a person, and what they need is internal and hidden. Over the story, they'll pursue what they want while slowly realising what they need. At the end, they may or may not get, they want, get, they, get what they want or what they need. You know, there's a classic Rolling Stones song that's sort of on that sort of topic. And in the second talk, uh, The Hero's Journey, we discussed the theory that most stories follow a similar pattern, or certainly those that are most successful or most remembered. Your main character's world is disrupted. They go on a journey, meeting different obstacles. Um, they may reach their goal, and they, don't, they sometimes get it, they sometimes don't, and then they return home, or at least have an intention to return home, usually as a changed person or character, because not all characters, of course, are people. But in this talk, we'll be talking about the type of characters they might meet along their adventure, as well as the main characters themselves. And of course, all stories have characters, even if it's a, a lonely cleaning robot or a flying elephant, these are all characters. So let's start with character. <clears throat> so what makes a character? Well, of course, you know, the they probably would be made up of three different things, physical attributes, non-physical attributes, and the relationships they have with the world and other people. Obviously, you can you know, put some of your examples in the chat box, you know, but, my, but I would say you know, the, from the physical side, there would be you know, age, gender, height. Um, so from the chat box, here we go. Um, Non-physical how they behave, their intellect, their emotional traits, what motivates them. Their relationships could be things like their, their connection to their parents, their friends, uh, to authority. Okay, so let's now talk about archetypes. So in screenwriting, an, you know, an archetype has a specific meaning. Archetypes have several different meanings, but in screenwriting, it is, is, it has, it is a, a particular definition. And in that, it's an archetype is an idealized model of a person that plays a specific role in your story. 
So we want to understand the benefit of them, use them where useful, but not to make them stereotypes. Because if they're used too much and too, in, a, in a too obvious way, a character, arc, an archetype becomes a stereotype, such as the evil stepmother and the gay best friend. I'm sure there's other stereotypes you can think of, and you can obviously put those in the chat box to sort of think of ones you see on the TV that maybe we don't see anymore because they've become outdated. You know. Interesting, when Pixar formed, they generated several rules about how they were going to tell stories. And one of them was there was going to be no evil stepmothers. If you think of Pixar and its history in relation to Disney, you know, Disney has a lot of um, evil stepmothers or evil women. And Pixar wanted to move away from that because they felt it was sort of old fashioned and probably also misogynist. But we'll see later that characters, archetypes, you know, can still be used, you know, in a fresh and interesting way, just as long as you can use your imagination. Anyone got anything in the chat box? Okay, I don't see any other suggestions. Any other stereotypes? Anyone else? Any stereotypes we can think of? Yes, no. okay. So you want some stereotypes, Merlin? Yeah, it's just if you, if anyone, is, anyone can think of any other stereotypes other than the evil stepmother or the gay best friend. That's right, yeah, the strong silent man, the sort of, yeah, the Clint Eastwood character. I think, as I say, Clint Eastwood has played the same character in every film, the strong silent man. The thug, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely there's a lot of, yeah, yeah. Voice of reason, yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there's usually one, like you say, Pip, there's usually one straight, straight laced person, the friendly vicar, that's good. Yeah, yeah, ditzy blondes. Yeah, 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 some really good ones there. Thank you. So these are all ones we should be aware of and we should try and avoid, unless we're really going to sort of play, make it aware to the audience that we're you know, deliberately using them as stereotypes to make fun of you know, the use of them or, or, or ourselves. So now you put those two together. So we've got a character archetype. So a character archetype in your story has specific traits that conform to an ideal that performs a particular role in your story. So where are, so what, what are they and where did they come from? <clears throat> so Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung introduced the concept of psychological archetypes, archetypes in 1919. Now he suggested that they arose through evolution, were limitless, but that some kept occurring. And he's the ones, the list that he had the, the hero, the child, the mother, the wild, wise old man, the trickster, the eternal boy, the cosmic man, and the artist scientist. So I think some of these will probably be familiar to us today. I think the hero, perhaps the mother and the, wilds, the wise old man, probably the later ones, perhaps less so. So just as there was Joseph Campbell with the hero's journey, so the hero is, is Carl Jung. Um, and, and as I say, he believed that history, you know, culture and personal context shaped these representations. And he also believed that archetypes combined with each other and interchange qualities. So he already, you know, sort of suggested what I'm going to suggest to you is that, you know, a little bit like the hero's journey, it has flexibility built in. We think about how many stories have been told to follow the hero's journey, and it's been millions. And so it just, and I guess it's the same thing I'm sort of going to try and persuade you with character archetypes is that if we can avoid the stereotypes, we've still got plenty of room for variety and flexibility and novelty and interest. Now, just like Joseph Campbell, there is criticism of Carl Jung's, you know, thinking. Um, but I think from a screenwriting viewpoint, as long as we avoid stereotypes that we've all discussed and suggested, we can avoid most of the negative or if not all the negative aspects that have been laid against this sort of theory. <clears throat> so if you remember how I showed that others built on Joseph Campbell's framework, you know, there's the heroine's journey and there's all sorts of other ways of using the hero's journey, you know, how our lives play out and so on. Others have built on Young's. Um, uh, so for instance, here's one that's quite interesting, Pearson, 
uh, and Mark, you know, they applied uh, the, the archetypes to branding, marketing. And then this is their book, The Hero and the Outlaw, building extraordinary brands through the power of archetypes. And they came up with their own list, hero, mentor, innocent, explorer, all the way down here. And you would see, I think, looking at this list, this is perhaps a little bit of a more modern list in terms of words that we might recognize. But there's lots and other, lots and lots of other lists. And if you go online, you'll see lots of different lists. And actually, there's none of them are wrong and none of them are right. They're just different people's views of the type of ways you can categorize um, you know, the characters that repeat themselves through stories. <clears throat> so I've come up with my own list. Uh, it's a little shorter than most of those ones you can find online and shorter, I suppose, than the ones that we've just looked at. But we're gonna use this list to describe the common, uh, we're gonna use this list and we're gonna go through these with examples and think about the common traits um, for each one. And hopefully as I show you the, my version, my description of what they sort of demonstrate as characters within stories, you might also think of other sort of characteristics of these uh, archetypes. And also as we show the examples, it would be nice if you could also think of some of your own examples I think some are certainly some of the earlier ones are easier than the later ones, but I think we should all be able to think of great examples uh, for the for the examples here, for this, for the archetypes I've listed here, and obviously you know un unmute yourself if you want to make suggestions as we go through them. Um, and of course, if you go online, you're going to see far more detailed characteristics and traits of the character archetypes that I'm going to go through. So obviously for something like the hero or the mentor, you can think of lots of different ways to describe them physically. Um, although, you know, I'm gonna show you that that's probably not the best way to describe these sort of character archetypes, but you can describe behaviors and the relationships they have. So I think the way to think about it in a fresh way is think of, when we think about characters, we talked about physical and non-physical attributes and relationships. It's probably best not to focus on the physical attributes of these character archetypes because they've been so overused that they actually you wouldn't use, you know, the traditional hero um, with the bulgy muscles anymore, but actually look to the non-physical traits as well as the behaviors. So you keep them true to their character archetype, but you keep, but you can create some freshness by subverting expectations. And as, you know, Carl Jung said, you can mix the attributes up. And I'm going to give you one quite famous example later on to show you how that can that can that can be uh, that's been done, you know, decades ago. So it's not a new thing to mix them up. So as we go through the examples, um, I'm going to show some movie clips. Um, they're generally mostly PG, uh, but there is one that's 18, and that's going to be probably where we have the break. You know, probably about yeah, probably half an hour or, or a bit more. Uh, or maybe less, let's see how the discussions go. Uh, but also I'll give you another warning before that clip, but obviously and most of the clips are PG, so I think we'll be okay. But obviously, you know, uh, to trigger warning, there is gonna be some bloodshed and a bit of swearing later on. Okay, so let's start with perhaps, you know, the one that's most relevant to the previous talk and it's probably the one that's the most well known is the hero. And so um, for my, interestingly, for a particular website called into that's called now called into the script, they were looking for articles and I said I'd write them an article on seven traits of a hero. And so these are these are the traits that I've come up with for what I consider the hero character archetype to be, and you'll find similar ones online. Of course, a hero can be an anti-hero, like the Joker or the Serpent, but you'll find that most of the traits will still apply, but obviously, of course, a lot of them, you know, some of them might be reversed, but actually most of them are pretty much the same. So let's go through them. So number one, be interesting. Well, if they're not interesting, we probably won't watch. And certainly I found when watching, you know, watching certain things like the serpent, I found, you know, the sort of the anti-hero and that not particularly interesting. And other heroes can be a bit dull. You know, if I think if you took, you know, James Bond or Superman 
out of their environment, they could be quite dull. But I think what's, what makes them interesting is because they get in interesting situations. And so they're in, in extraordinary worlds and they do extraordinary things. So though, even if you met them for a coffee, they might feel quite bland. When they're doing their thing, they are interesting. Perhaps the more interesting heroes who are not you know, superheroes or secret agents are the outsiders. So if you think about some of your favorite films or TV series, you, you start to realize that actually most of the heroes are outsiders. They're on the edge of society or they're within society, but they see the world in a quite different way. So if you think of, you know, sort of Ricky Gervais in the office, and he believes that the best way to be a boss is to be funny and to be entertaining and for his staff to like him. Most, most bosses, most managers, no, that is not the most, you know, not, not the most um, you know, important thing in being, in being a boss. So he has an outsider view of what being a boss is. And that makes him interesting because as, as people are trying to you know, watch these stories and we get involved in it and learn from it, we want to, it's fascinating to see how somebody with this unusual view is going to deal with the world. And actually, perhaps they have not only an interesting perspective on it, perhaps they have an interesting, maybe they have the answer. Or maybe we just want to see how this outsider is going to actually transform and change and actually become more normative in terms of society. OK, um, I mean, one of those some of those examples might be Schindler and Schindler's List. You know, he chose to, to you know, rescue Jews where most of his compatriots turned a blind eye. Amelie, you know, the French film where she wants to make everybody happy by making small changes to their lives in secret. Or Hanky in Breaking Bad, who decides that the best way to tr help his family is to become a drug lord. I mean, that's that's quite an extreme decision to make. And these cute characters chose choose an unexpected path. Number two, they want two things. So we've covered this before. Uh, your hero must want something, an external, uh, an external, external target, an object or, or achievement to win a tournament or get somewhere. But they also, which drives their actions, but also have an inner need that sort of surfaces and is often resolved at the end. So they're both external and internal drivers. Number three, have a superpower. They're not a literal superpower. Clearly, superheroes have a literal superpower. But actually, the hero of a story generally has a skill, something they're good at. So, of course, we think of Breaking Bad. It, Hank's a chemistry teacher, which is a great skill to have if you're trying to make drugs. Okay. Um, so, and number four, uh, they exhibit flaws. So the reason they exhibit flaws is firstly, that makes them more human. And secondly, it's, it means they're not, we'll empathize with them. I mean, I've, if you've ever read or seen a, read a story where the hero is perfect, it's, it's very difficult to read, very dull, very challenging to stay engaged. Um, so generally or always, you know, a successful hero in story terms will have some sort of flaw, whether it be kryptonite, or selfishness, or ditziness, or you know, or you know that, that that those are those are the sort of type of flaws, personality flaws, not always physical flaws, but are usually personality flaws. Being perfect is annoying. Number five, uh, they should lead the action. The hero needs to be active. If not, we we'll lose interest. If we're putting ourselves in their shoes, which obviously good stories do, and they don't take any action, we get bored. If anyone saw the Rogue One Star Wars film, you know, the main actor didn't, the main act character didn't take le the lead in most of the early parts of the story, and most, a lot of people found it boring. Number six, the hero needs to make mistakes. There's the oops here. Uh, this is how we learn, and we want to see how, how a hero copes with obstacles. And that leads on to number seven. There we go, the tree and the woman showing resilience. Of course, if they gave up halfway through, we wouldn't have a story. So they need to get to the end of the story. So here's, our, here's my seven traits of what makes a hero. <clears throat> 
let's see if I can now play an example. So let's see if this works. Okay, so this is the first video. Let's have a go. Actually, I'm just going to <coughs> do sound and do the sound and share sound, optimize for clip. Here we go. Try again. Try now. <laughs> okay, so so did we spot any of the traits I listed? You can unmute yourself, maybe or put it in the chat. If I go back to the seven traits, was he interesting? Well, I think he, he caught a car, that's quite interesting. One, two things, well, I think that's perhaps too much to get in just a short clip. But I would say he probably wants to sort of save lives because he saved the woman's life in the car. Well, clearly, obviously, he's Superman, so he has a superpower. He can fly and he's got strength. Flaws, well, we've not seen any flaws. Um, he led the action. He chose to catch the car. We've not seen him make any mistakes. Um, and we've not seen him show any resistance, resilience. Well, perhaps, I suppose he did keep, you could argue he flew and he caught the car and he put the car down. So I guess he sort of kept going, but it wasn't much of an obstacle for Superman. So I think even in a clip of like 30 seconds, we can already see that he exhibited uh, quite a few, quite a few uh, of, of the hero's traits. Yes, box floor, I think would be, um, he, he can only, he can't lie. Logic. He can't lie, that's right. He can't lie, which is seen in other films actually. Um, just out here's a quiz question for you in that clip can anyone if that was an early part of the hero's journey or the early part of the episode can anyone remember what the save the cat moment is so the save the cat moment in a story is when the hero does something that has no actual benefit to themselves so if superman is about saving lives obviously saving the the woman in the car is part of his DNA, but what did he do? What did Superman do in that clip that actually wasn't related to his general um, being? Can anyone see what he did in that clip? Everything. Uh, say that again, Tim? Everything. I mean, um, le letting a car down gently instead of crashing was, was the- Yeah, so that- Gave the cat back to the kid, didn't he? Yes, that's the answer. Yeah, so I gave the cat back. Gave the cat back to the kid. So he did something extra that was unnecessary. Oh, that had gave that was really no benefit to him as an individual, but it was a sort of selfless act. I know it's very. I know it's. I picked a clip that's hard to make the separation as clear as it could be, but I just thought it was quite a nice little touch that they add added because he could have just flown off, but he did the cat back to the kid. So that shows he has empathy, you know, that gives us empathy for him because obviously we almost expect Superman, you know, superheroes to save things, but he actually also did something nice as well. Anyway, I thought it was a nice touch. I thought it was a nice touch. And that's from the new Superman and Lois series. Okay. Looks good. It looks good. It looks sort of sort of sort of back to the old old style Superman. I think it's what's quite interesting if not if you've not seen it yet. From the trailers, he's got they got two kids, two kids in the in the new series. Okay, let's move on to the next one, the mentor, or sometimes called the wise old man or woman or the sage. Of course, this is another really famous archetype, character archetype. This individual is known for their wisdom. Oh yes, the praise for the mother. That's good. Well spotted, Tim. Uh, they guide the hero on their journey, offering advice, and something I know. Sort of, um, we talked about before, they know the answer. And so the Tim, I know, remember Tim picked up on this. Yeah, they know the answer and they tell the hero what he needs to know to make the necessary change in his life. They tell them at the beginning, but of course, if the hero just said, oh, 
that's all I need to do to be a better person. You'd have no story. So the hero generally ignores the mentor, or if not ignores the mentor, they'd sort of listen, but don't change straight away, or they maybe don't acknowledge the mentor. Sometimes they do actually ignore the mentor. So the hero then still has to go on their journey uh, before he will, or sometimes not, accept what the mentor told him all along. There's a new film called um, Sound of Metal with Riz Ahmed. I uh, saw it last week, it's a beautiful film. And there, this, uh, the main character, Luke, is a drummer and he loses his hearing and he gets sent to a deaf community. But the deaf community also treats people with addiction, which he had. And the person that runs the sort of community says, we were, we, what we try and do first is fix up here and then fix here. They basically, you know, they fix their, you know, got to fix their head first before they fix their hearing. But of course, you know, the main character doesn't want to know that. He just wants his hearing back or he wants to learn sign language. And so he doesn't want to fix, you know, his addictive personality. So here's the, uh, so this is the mentor. So we touched on this. You might remember when we did the hero's journey, we touched on Mr. Miyagi, you know, wipe off, what is it? Wash on, wipe off. You know, if you watch the new series, it's quite funny. They sort of make fun of that whole thing. So Mr. Miyagi is one of the most famous from the, who's from the Karate Kid. I'm going to show you a clip from probably the next, without using Merlin, which would be a bit too obvious, probably the next most uh, famous, famous uh, mentor. So if you can maybe see who's first on the chat button to say who this character is, you probably already guess. Here we go. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Brilliant. Well done, Tim wins the prize. So, there's the, so there is um, Gandalf basically telling Frodo, I'm not sure if this is the people might who are better experts than the Lord of the Rings than me, knows whether this is the first or the second. But he tells Frodo, you know, what the answer is. It's, it, you can't choose if, if fate has made, made, given you a task or you, you can't, you know, it's up, to, it's up, it's the, the decision to be made as the hero is how you're going to deal with that responsibility. And so that's, that's the real test. You can't ignore the responsibility. You've got to sort of, you know, Frodo's got to learn, decide whether to take it. He can't wish it away. He's either, he's got to deal with it in some way. And so obviously then, of course, he chooses to take the ring to Mordor. Yeah, do you get mentors with an experienced heroes? I suppose, yeah, I mean, I suppose, I suppose all heroes are inexperienced in the sense that they learn something in the story that's being told. So the mentor, you know, generally does, you know, does, um, you know, tell them something. I mean, of course, we think of Spider-Man and his uncle sort of tells him, you know, with great power becomes great responsibility. So that's when Spider-Man is, I think, just becoming Spider-Man, isn't it? So generally, and often the mentor dies, you know, so they obviously dies in Spider-Man, which also because Spider-Man feels, you know, he feels responsible, like he's in that extra drive, you know, to be a superhero and, you know, fight for good. And what you often find is, yes, you know, in, in a lot of these, even superheroes generally often have somebody who's a mentor. Not always. I mean, Superman, I think, usually it's his parents who are alive. And even in some of the films, he sort of talks, doesn't he, back to the computer or back to the sort of the memories of his parents from Krypton. So you see even, in, you know, but of course, most of these superheroes or most heroes are going into a new world. So, you know, so they are sort of inexperienced in the sense that they could be a very experienced superhero, but they're then thrown into a new world. So Spider-Man, you think how many bloody movie spider-man's been in the latest rumor is that he's going to be sent into outer space <laughs> so they have they've so obviously given up trying to find him a new world on earth <laughs> they're going to have to throw him into space to make an experienced superhero inexperienced so that's how i'd answer that question mark yeah do mentors have mentors yeah that's a good question i suppose 
they probably did have mentors. Yeah, so I suppose you could go back and, and have mentors. And of course, if anyone's seen the Queen's Gambit, you know, she has multiple mentors. So then the beautiful, you know, I think it's the most successful TV series in the last, in history or something in the last two years or something, you know, number of viewing figures. But in that series, if you watch every episode, she has a mentor. It's very clever. So instead of just having a Gandalf, in every episode, she has a different mentor. And of course, it works in some ways because obviously she's learning to get better and better at chess. So it works in the sense that she can always have somebody who will then tell her how to or teach her how to get better at chess. So in the first episode, it's the janitor. And then as she goes through, it's usually a better and better you know, chess player. And I think in maybe one of the last episodes, it's her best friend who comes back and is, the, and is her mentor who actually says to her, I'm not going to help you. But it's a funny way. Sometimes sometimes the mentors, you know, play tricks on, on you know, on, on the hero. And of course, some heroes don't have mentors. Some stories don't have mentors. And of course, that makes it even tougher for the hero to reach their story end. So in some ways, you might choose not to have the mentor to make it even more difficult for your hero, which makes stories all the more richer. Okay. Die Hard. I think Die Hard is probably the policeman, isn't it, Mark? The policeman down on the ground, I think. Right, and here's another example uh, coming up of a different type of mentor, just to show that it doesn't have to be the old wise man. Keep it under 65. We don't want to be pulled over. Affirmative. No, 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 no. You gotta listen to the way people talk. You don't say affirmative or some shit like that. You say, no problemo. And if someone comes off to you with an attitude, you say, eat me. And if you want to shine them on, it's hasta la vista, baby. Hasta la vista, baby. Yeah, or later, dickwad. And if someone gets upset, you say, chill out. Or you could do combinations. Chill out. Dickwad. That's great. See, you're getting it. No problemo. <laughs> no problemo. Brilliant. And of course, probably all of you remember the end of the scene where he destroys the other Terminator. You know, the, he, he says, Asta la vista, baby. So brilliant, brilliant come, you know, brilliant writing by James Cameron to sort of put that in later on. And also brilliant of James Cameron to turn, you know, obviously, and this is the, this is the sequel to in, the, in the first film. You know, Connor is, you know, sort of the, is the traditional hero, but obviously the Terminator, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger was so popular, they had to sort of make him really the protagonist or the hero of the story. And so they basically made Connor the, men the mentor. And of course, of course, he does go up to, of course, be the leader. And so he sort of becomes a sort of mentor as well for his, you know, for his army, because of course he's been fighting Terminators for years. So it sort of fits with the whole time travel thing that he would have, you know, sort of be wise before his time. But I think it's still very clever to, you know, to give him those mentor qualities, you know, early on. And actually, if you watch this film, you know, you, you could make arguments for all three of those people in the car being the protagonist or hero of the story. You know, it must have been so difficult for James Cameron, you know, because he obviously had to sell the part to each three of them and probably all three of them thought they should be the hero. You know, even, even the young kid's agent, you know, and he's obviously done a wonderful job of sort of, you know, giving them all effectively their own, <laughs> almost their own hero's journey, but also give them, they all get, they all play mentors in a way, because even the beginning of that scene, she says, keep, keep the car below 65. So she's almost being a mentor herself. So they all, almost all interchanging the sort of mentor hero protagonist roles. Very, very skillfully done very skillfully done from a story point of view. Okay. Right. Uh, you can have multiple heroes. Yeah, so I've simplified this to sort of think about, you can have multiple heroes. So a hero is really a character archetype, and it, but you can, you can, you know, shift. So the hero's journey, if you apply it, I mean, this might be a topic for another talk, Graham. You know, I've done some, a lot of work sort of analyzing sitcoms, so I've applied the sort of thinking, this is sort of, I'm mostly repeating what, um, you know, is out there, but I've done a lot of my own work looking at the psychology of 
going further than this and look at how you can apply this type of thinking to ensembles, to Big Bang Theory, to the A-Team, to anything with um, you know, multiple characters and so that you can apply the character archetypes or different types of character archetypes to groups and so therefore you help them to be different. And I've sort of, I could always do another talk on that if people are interested in you know, things like the Big Bang Theory or whatever. And one, of course, one, one thing you, you do, if you were doing a hero's journey of, say, something like ER or um, those type of very, well, what seem to be formulaic shows, what you do is you have the hero's journey throughout the episode and you give each stage to a different person this casualty, ER, you know, these type of shows. So you plot the hero's journey and then you just make different, you give each person, like in just the example we talk, talked about, you give them the protagonist role in their scene. So if it's at the point of the hero's journey where it's meet the mentor, whoever's the protagonist then in that scene is going to get advice from somebody. And then you get to the midpoint and so on. So you just pass, it's almost like a baton, like you said, with some of the examples in the chat box, you pass the baton on you know, to different people within the, uh, the ensemble cast. The trickster or shapeshifter, they can be separate character archetypes, but my feeling is in most cases, they tend to be often the same. So, um, you know, so, I mean, there's, you know, I'll see some, you know, obviously I tend to think of sort of, um, you know, Marvel type examples because Marvel, you know, you think of, um, you know, where Stan Lee and his writing and his collaborators, collaborators, artists got a lot of their ideas from, they took it a lot from mythological characters. So they sort of, you know, they've embraced maybe subconsciously a lot of these sort of, um, you know, Joseph Campbell, you know, mythological tricks. So that's why I tend to use a lot of those examples. Plus I like them. Now the trickster tends to have high intellect or secret knowledge and which they use to play tricks, disobey rules and defy conventional behavior. They can be cunning or foolish or both. They openly ask questions and disrupt or, or, or mock authority. In African communities, the rabbit, spider or hare is the trickster. Uh, in Europe, uh, Renard the Fox is a well-known. I don't know if anybody had the Renard the Fox books as a kid. And they're really useful for providing twists and unexpected turns in your plot. So North mythology, giving a clue now what the next clip is going to be, the mischief maker is Loki. So Loki is probably the one of the most well-known ones, who is also a shapeshifter. So that's why I sort of, you know, you can often put the two together. Loki also in, in you know, certainly not in, uh, maybe in the new series, but certainly not in the Marvel films, Loki also exhibits gender variability. In one case, he even becomes pregnant. Uh, he actually becomes, also becomes a horse that gives birth uh, to Odin's eight-legged uh, eight horse Slipnir. So, yeah, I wouldn't say Tony Stark is a trickster, but he's definitely, I think his character is one of, well, I suppose actually they did do that trick with the glove at the end. So he's a little bit and he does change his appearance. So yeah, so Tony Stark does have a little bit of the trickster in him. But here's the example, example I've picked. And actually one thing to watch here is look at how, look how brilliantly the, the actor here is, you know, plays effectively a different character, you know, than, than he is. Father. Uh, my son Thor has returned. Greetings, my boy. It's an interesting play. What's it called? The tragedy of Loki of Asgard. People wanted to commemorate him. Ah, indeed they should. Oh, I like the statue. A lot better looking than he was when he was alive. A little, a little less weasley, less greasy, maybe. Do you know what this is? Oh, the skull of Serta. That's a formidable weapon. Do me a favor. Lock this away in a vault so it doesn't turn into a giant monster and destroy the whole planet. Thank you, dear. Um, so it's, um, back to Midgard for you, is it? Nope. You know, I've been having this reoccurring dream lately. Every night I see Asgard falling to ruins. That's just a silly dream. Science of an overactive imagination. Possibly. But then I decide to go out there and investigate. And what do I find with the nine realms completely in chaos? 
Enemies of Asgard assembling, plotting our demise, all while you, Odin, the protector of those nine realms, are sitting here in your bathrobe eating grapes. Yes, well, it is best to respect our neighbor's freedom. Yes, of course. The freedom to be massacred. Yes. Besides, I've been rather busy myself. Watching theater. Well, board meetings and security council meetings. Are you and... really going to make me do it? Do what? You know that nothing will stop me on here as it returns to my hand. Not even your face. You've gone quite mad. You, you, you'll be executed for this. And I'll see you on the other side, brother. All right, I yield! <laughs> there you go, Tom Hiddleston there. Um, yeah, so Mark, that's a good question on the uh, trickster. Yes, yeah, so... Um, yeah, they can be the baddie, and they're often the baddie. But I think, you know, we think about, you know, Carl Jung said about how they can switch. You know, so there's a lot of sort of fluidity between their traits and where they sit on the spectrum. So heroes can be anti-heroes, thinking of, you know, Joker and things like that, um, if it's put in a sort of right story structure. So obviously, you know, the, this example luckily works really well for me because obviously Loki like you say, is like you say, is often on the bad side for all the films, and then very at the very end, he actually does something honourable. He sort of tries to save his brother, and sort of loses his life. So I think, yeah. So that's the nice thing. Again, you play around with stereotypes or character archetypes and sort of keep them fresh. And I think the other one, of course, we might know if you watch the X Men, is Mystique. You know, who's the you know the blue woman who can change appearance. You know, she, I think, throughout the comics has switched backwards and forwards between sort of goodies and baddies. I don't know if they always end up doing good. I think it's just, I suppose we almost expect, we're to, well, do we expect it? No, I don't think so. I suppose we may, well, maybe we do. Maybe we think that people always are redemptive and perhaps they might always, you know, through prison or whatever, might do good. But that's obviously not the truth. Some evil people are always evil. Um, but yeah, I think, we, I think, and most of the time, as we can see, they're not, you know, they're not often doing real harm. You know, it's normally just petty stuff like Loki here, silly stuff. Okay. The Everyman. Okay. So the Everyman allows the audience to understand the strange new world through their eyes. They are you and I. Although this character may uh, face obstacles and adversities, ad adversities that a hero might, they typically avoid engagement. They typically, you know, they don't fight. They sort of run away. However, if the situation demands effective reaction to avert disaster, uh, which they take, this then then makes them the protagonist because the protagonist is the main character in the story, and they're delivering. You know, they're delivering the, uh, the, the pushing the story forward. But of course, as we've discussed, you know, when we are now thinking in the world of SOV, SVODs, where we're getting these long TV series, of course, characters can swap their roles. And we've already discussed even things like ER and Casualty, you know, the sort of the mantle of the protagonist can shift. But generally, you know, generally, you know, that's if it changes too much too often, it can be unsettling. I think soaps are perhaps different, but if, if, Things, things like the examples we've given, they generally expect people to sort of mostly stay within their roles. Yeah, Bill Bow might be an everyman, although he is, like you say, because he's the buddy, he has heroic qualities. That's a really good, that's a really interesting one. I think Frodo is driving the action and Bill Bow sort of follows along, doesn't he? Uh, but you could, you could also make an argument that he's a hero. Yeah, it's, 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 say it's not, you know, there's, there's no rules. <laughs> <laughs> only tools, there's only guidance, there's only suggestions uh, of how, how to, how to analyse films but also use this knowledge for yourselves. Now, if the, um, of course, if they don't take action, the everyman just becomes a secondary character. Okay. It's a useful character, from my experience, in worlds of lots of strangeness, particularly heroic or powerful figures. So if it's a very peculiar world, 
then every man can sort of shine a light on that. Or if it's a world that needs lots of explanation, the every man can ask lots of dumb questions. Um, and yeah, and obviously, of course, the other good thing about the every man in a very dangerous, scary world is that it, it becomes more interesting because they're if they're very weak in comparison to everybody else, you know, it just it just highlights the sort of the power or the strangeness of or the danger that, that the world is uh, and to, to, to you and I. So it makes us feel more scared because here's this weak, weak little creature. I think it might be why in the in the most latest of Marvel films, you know, they I think perhaps also in the, the sort of the night the Batman trilogy, they made a deliberate attempt to have normal people. I know there's no such thing as a normal person, but what they did is they obviously had people, you know, they had extras, they had secondary actors, they had crowds of people that were sort of, and it was set in sort of the real world. So unlike Batman's in the Tim Burton era, where you felt that everything was sort of artificial. Whereas if you suddenly set Batman or the new or the modern superheroes in our world, it feels like we can we can also we can identify with the heroes, but we can also identify with the normal townsfolk who could easily get killed <laughs> if the superhero mm -hmm. decides to sort of flick their hand by accident across their face. And actually, if you watch this next clip, is a really good example of that. You know, in in um, you know in uh, in this clip, I'm going to show you. You know, lots of very very sort of normal people get killed by seemingly good people, but they're actually not good. They're bad people. Um, yeah, so Golem's a, Golem's probably a good example of he could be the trickster. Yeah. Yeah, because he sort of, does he do any tricks or does he change appearance? I suppose he has already changed appearance. Um, yeah, Dr. Watson is, I would say, Dr. Watson is, is yeah, is, an ex is a buddy. So the buddies, I suppose if we think about it, when the buddies are buddies to very powerful or bright or heroic people, they do tend to be sort of ordinary. Um, and actually, if you think about, in the original Dr. Watson, actually, he did actually do some medical work. And it seems that the more Sherlock Holmes has gone over time, often that role has been diminished. Um, but, you know, normally, basically, the doctor, you know, the doctor comes in at the very last minute and what, revives somebody and or says they're dead. <laughs> That's it. You know, I think maybe the American version is, uh, is it Lucy Liu plays Watson. I think she's far more active and far more more. Uh, active in you know. Moriarty I would say Moriarty is probably more the anti-hero or I'm going to show call it the shadow in a minute um, but you're right I guess one of the ways that um, the antagonist um, tries to stop the hero or the protagonist uh, is through tricking or being deceptive and that was I guess the, I think you would say Moriarty is the shadow or the antagonist that uses deception as part of his superpower so Sherlock Holmes if you I'm going to show you that they're sort of opposites so Sherlock Holmes everything is mostly up front I think the modern the modern some of the modern Sherlock Holmes he doesn't always tell you what he's thinking because Dr Watson provides that foil he provides the way Dr Watson can ask the silly questions I think because he he's very up front who he is he lives on a busy street everyone knows he is Moriarty is the opposite he's sort of uh, you know, in the shadows, secretive, no one knows who he, know who he is. Um, yeah, so the, the trickster is more flying the ointment. You know, they're a very good way for, you know, the sort of the, the antagonist to create disruption or forget a spy, put a spy into the works, fly in the ointment to get information, to trick people. So in the X-Men, Mystique, yeah, she gets she she pretends to be a security guard so she can so she can release uh, her boss, you know, from the from the prison. So she pretends to be the the um, the security guard so she can go pie pass all security and get through, get her boss out boss out of this plastic prison. Okay, so the next clip's coming up, and as I said, this is an eighteen rated clip. So if you don't, if you're squeamish, uh, you can go for your break now. We're gonna have a break after this clip anyway. 
So if you don't like bloodshed or swearing, uh, then uh, go for your break a minute or two early. Here we go. <clears throat> Here is Huey, the everyman. What the fuck? Come on in, Mama. Pick up, damn you. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Oh, oh hello. Easy does it, lad. No trouble from us. You just stroll on by, yeah? I don't want them to hurt me again. Oh, no. No, no, no one's gonna hurt you, son. Uh, we're all friends here, aren't we? Okay. So I stop sharing there. So, Hugh, so in that example, Huey, the guy in the, in the van, he's the everyman. So he's there, as you can see, he's doing the classic everyman thing. He's observing <laughs> all these strange things going on. He's sort of hiding in the van. And so the woman there, she's super powered. The guy is obviously in the t-shirt, he's super powered. <laughs> uh, not very well, obviously. And then the guy in the black, black shirt the black jacket you know he's obviously playing you know, he's dr mccoy in star trek he's the sort of more traditional hero so he's the sort of you know he leads the action he's the more sort of protagonist he's he's obviously sweary he 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 wants to sort of um kill all the bad superheroes where huey he's just got sucked into this world because his uh because of his something happened to his girlfriend and therefore he wants to he wants to also take part in 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 un, unearthing all the the seemingly good superheroes behaving badly so he's got sucked into this world he's totally out of his league but because the whole world is for superheroes he can ask all the silly questions that you know we want the answer to and he can just follow through you know, follow through the action. Sometimes he does lead the action, uh, but most often the time he's hiding in the van or hiding somewhere behind a wall, which is, of course, what we would do. If suddenly there was an evil Superman, I could tell you we wouldn't be walking up to them. We'll be running as far away as we could. And so that's what Huey does. He spends most of his time running away from things. Okay. Presumably, um, presumably Merlin, he can bring in the humour as well, when everyone else is quite serious. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know if it's, um, yeah. So he can bring in the humour. He can, um, yeah. I mean, he can look scared. I mean, he could be scared because obviously most, because most, many of the characters in this show are superheroes. So a lot of the time they're not scared really of anybody. They're sort of scared of the, the most powerful superheroes. <laughs> But they're generally, you know, most of them are indestructible. They're not really scared of anything. <laughs> so therefore, he plays that wonderful role of fear. So he he is scared, but he also makes jokes. Almost he doesn't tend to make jokes about, you know, the, the, the superheroes because he'll get his head taken off. But he can make jokes about the absurdity of the world that he's found himself in. So again, he's come into this world. So in some ways, then again, he's the protagonist, but he's not the traditional hero. So he's almost like the protagonist playing every man in the hero's journey. So also, I know it's that. So there's no. So again, I'm trying to. I mean, it took me a long time to accept this with my own writing, that things weren't fixed, and I couldn't always, you know, say this. This is. I couldn't. There wasn't a formula. It was very. I found it very difficult initially not to sort of real, not to not to accept that it. There wasn't a formula. It was just suggestions of things how things could work. And once I got past that, you then can see them as the flexibility. And once you accept 
accept the flexibility, then that course then means, you know, you can be far more creative than just following a formula. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Well, thanks, Tony. I think, so uh, I, I think so that's I think, our, our break. Yeah. Um, that was great. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, I don't. Um, so, shall we have uh, 10 minutes? Right. Okay. Thanks, for everyone, for coming back. Let's keep going. So we've got a couple more character archetypes to do. And then we'll have a bit more of a discussion. So, I think we've got, yeah, about 11 slides left. The Herald. The herald usually appears in the beginning and often they informs the hero of an important event, setting the story in motion. You know, it still seem, it seems old, as old fashioned, but it does exist. It doesn't always have to be a person, it could be a thing or an object. You have the letter inviting Cinderella to the ball, uh, R2-D2 with his message, or the prize awaiting anyone able to pull the sword from the stone. You know, these could all be seen as sort of a call to action, you know, an opportunity for the, the protagonist in our story to enter a new world, you know, move out of their existing world. Often the hero refuses. You might remember from the hero's journey, the hero often refuses. We showed that uh, clip of um, Ray from Star Wars where she's offered Luke Sky, Sky uh, uh, you know, her laser, um, and um, she refuses it and runs out of the cave. But often they sort of then, you know, the next opportunity, they go on their journey. Lightsaber, lightsaber. And the herald doesn't always have to be truthful. So the herald sometimes is uh, is a liar. And they actually so almost create, they, they can actually make the hero go on a journey, but maybe not the journey that, uh, that, that, that they think they're on. You know, or they might be persuaded to go somewhere, but actually it's a trick, you know. Um, and of course, if you remember the film 300, the heralds that come to, uh, is it the Trojans? They come to negotiate the Trojans. <laughs> the Trojans just push them down a pit. So the heralds often, uh, you know, get a bit of a comeuppance. Okay, so here's, think about this one. Uh, so what, what do the witches tell Macbeth? All hail Macbeth. <laughs> yes. What are these? Live you or are you that man may question? Speak if you can, what are you? Yes, well done, Sue. First prize to you. Yeah, they tell they tell um, Macbeth that he's going to be king and set him on his journey to disaster, don't they? And Macbeth is, is sort of a little bit like um, you know Breaking Bad is sort of based on Macbeth. They believe so. Macbeth is that classic sort of story where somebody sort of starts here and then you know works their way down to the sort of the you know the demise. You know they sort of start they sort of um, you know it's a sort of it's the it's a less fashionable hero's journey with a happy ending. It's the sort of you know one of the greatest stories, isn't it? Where you know a good person becomes bad, or isn't it? In sort of um, Breaking Bad, it's Mister Mister Chips becomes uh, Don Corleone or something. You know. The next one I want to talk about is the gatekeeper, or sometimes called the threshold guardian. They act as an obstacle to the protagonist entering somewhere new. They test the hero's commitment. So he talks about the hero being resilient and wanting to keep moving forwards, you know, drive the action. And so, you know, they sort of, it's another way of creating tension or conflict in your story by, you know, putting another obstacle in their way. So the gatekeeper is really good for, good, good about, good for that purpose. 
usually occurs from Act 1 to Act 2 or Act 2 to Act 3. So you remember Act 1 to Act 2 is where the, your main, your protagonist goes from um, it's his ordinary world into the new world. Do you remember we saw Dorothy um, landing, uh, landing in Oz? So she's going for, she goes from her sepia world into the multicolored world. And you're about to sort of see where she goes from, you know, the sort of um, Oz into, you know, the Emerald Palace. The gatekeeper's role is to keep the unworthy from entering or in some way to prevent the hero from reaching their prize. They overcome through persuasion or deception. They can be defeated, Princess Bride, where he sort of converts the, the sort of the, uh, the gatekeepers, the sort of, um, you know, the sort of minor villains to his side. And they can be made into an ally in Thor Ragnarok. We saw a clip from that. They, he obviously turns Idris Elba into the gatekeeper. You remember that Rainbow, Rainbow Bridge? So he obviously, um, Thor and the gatekeeper sort of get on and the gatekeeper helps them get to the next next destination. They can take plenty of forms like all of these character archetypes. One I often spot is the um, bodyguard or security guard to, you know, uh, the baddies palace or the nightclub or, or something like that, you know, or, you know, um, I guess in Matrix it might be that, you know, where they go into that, uh, they go into the sort of the agents, they go to rescue Morpheus and they have to go through the, um, they have to go through the metal detectors, don't they? Yeah, the detective who doesn't listen to a complaint. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's go to the next clip. Of course, I had to pick something for Wizard of Oz, didn't I? So here we go. Enjoy this. There we go. That's a horse of a different colour. We don't use that phrase much anymore. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll, just to go back on that one, can we also think and the gatekeeper in this clip, who else the gatekeeper plays? There's also the, he's the Wizard of Oz, isn't he? So the Wizard of Oz, you know, in, in sort of character archetypes, the sort of the wizard, there's all, there are character archetypes such as the wizard. There's also the king and there's also the sort of creator so he also sort of plays the creator, because I think the idea, I think, in the prequel, isn't it, is that uh, Oz actually creates the world. But um, obviously he plays two roles in this, but obviously the one I'm using is his role as the gatekeeper. The Shadow. This is the last one, I think. Yeah, the Shadow, the antagonist, is the major opposing force that prevents our hero from reaching their goal. It can, of course, be a range of villains, you know, lieutenants and officers and then, you know, the general at the top. Um, but they usually result in a single entity at the end, even if you think about all these superhero film, films, you know, that, you know, the Avengers or, you know, the Justice League, they might fight the sort of the, the, the infantry, but often they then have the final battle, um, you know, with the top dog. 
of course, you know, the shadow considers themselves the hero of their own journey. I mean, sometimes that's not the case, uh, but normally they don't think they're doing anything wrong or they felt they're being driven to do what they do. Um, one thing that's interesting uh, that I've been investigating is that, of course, they're, they're related to the hero's inner need. So um, if you think of Luke in Star Wars, you know, if his inner need is to find family, well, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, Darth Vader is his father. So they sort of can link to the inner need. So if you're thinking about story creation, think about what is the inner need driving your hero and then see if it can be manifested within the, uh, the, uh, the shadow. Of course, the most powerful antagonists seem to be those that are the opposites of your protagonist. So Batman and the Joker. So Batman is serious, you know, wears black, you know, is, a, you know, is strong. Joker chats a lot, wears colour, you know, doesn't tend to be a great fighter, uses other methods, guns, knives. Superman, you know, not obviously clever, uh, strong, indestructible, super, you know, superhuman. You know, Lex Luthor, you know, he's human, so he's vulnerable, but he's super intelligent. You know, Superman wears, you know, blue and red and bright colours usually. Luthor tends to be, you know, more sombre in suits. So often that's another way to think about stories when you're watching them or when you're creating your own, you know, to make make your sort of, you know, the baddie, the opposite of your goodie. One thing I often do is I have a table, I write down all the attributes of my hero, and then I just do the opposites. And of course, you can just go into a thesaurus and find the antonyms and just find the opposites of their traits. And then, then that just defines the behaviours of your antagonist or your shadow. I think here is now going to be one of possibly the most uh, awful uh, shadows in film history. As long as you don't serve the chicken that way. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, um... What are the blues? They're calling it an accident. Who's the investigating officer? Lou Escobar. He's a lieutenant. You know him? Oh, yeah. Where from? We used to work together in Chinatown. <clears throat> Would you call him a capable man? Very. Honest? As far as it goes. Of course, he has to swim in the same water we all do. Of course, but you've no reason to think he's bungled the case. None. Not too bad. Too bad? Hmm. Disturbs me. It makes me think you're taking my daughter for a ride. Financially speaking, of course. What are you charging her? My usual fee. What's the bonus if I get results? Are you um, sleeping with her? Come, come, Mr. Gibbs. You don't have to think about that, remember. Yeah. If you want an answer to that question, Mr. Cross, I'll put one of my men on the job. Good afternoon. Mr. Gibbs. Giddis. Giddis. You're dealing with a disturbed woman who just lost her husband. I don't want her taken advantage of. Sit down. What for? You may think you know what you're dealing with. But believe me, you don't. Why is that funny? It's what the district attorney used to tell me in Chinatown. Yeah? Was he right? Exactly what do you know about me? Sit down. Mainly that you're rich and too respectable to want your name in the newspapers. Of course I'm respectable. I'm old. Politicians, ugly buildings, and whores all get respectable if they last long enough. Okay, so what can we, um, what can we sort of think about that clip? So, um, you know, what, so I just go back to Mark's question. Is the mayor, the mayor is the gate, is the uh, is sort of a gatekeeper because he's preventing. He's preventing um, the sheriff from closing down the beach. The uh, shark is the shadow. Yeah, so if we think about this character, you know, I mean, this is an extraordinary scene. So often you find in Hero's journey, 
the protagonist meets the antagonist early on and they have this sort of tete-a-tete uh, before uh, moving on, um, separating and then coming back at the end. And you can see in this, in this film, you know, he's entered, he's actually entered the lair of the, of the antagonist, the shadow, and it seems very nice. You know, here is this extraordinary meal, but I mean, look at the, look at the extraordinary idea of actually overdoing the meal. I mean, look at that, the fish's head, you know, and all this extraordinary food is, food is just so over the top. And he's sitting there with his hat on, you know, Gittis is taking off his hat because he's, he's being polite, but really where's the power lie? The power lies with the shadow, doesn't it? You know, and do you see how in the, in the middle of the scene, how Gittis is there sort of, they're on sort of equal terms. And then he asks if he's sleeping with his daughter and the whole power shifts in that scene at the midpoint. So every scene is like a story beginning, middle and end. And in the midpoint, you know, things shift. So you can see here in the midpoint, you know, the hero on our right, Jake Gittis, he suddenly is then suddenly thrown, thrown asunder because, because, you know, the woman he's sleeping with, his father has just asked him, are you sleeping with my daughter? And his one first reaction is to escape. And he tries to escape, but then of course, you know, the shadow then sort of, sort of then reminds him of his past. And he sort of says, you know, when you were in Chinatown, did you win? And basically Gittis didn't win when he was in Chinatown. And so he basically embarrasses Gittis in to staying, to coming back to the table to try and win again. And of course, if you know at the, at the end of this film, Gittis never wins because basically power is, power is all powerful. And sometimes, you know, even the greatest hero cannot overturn, you know, the odds. Which is why it's such a classic film and a Brit you know brilliantly written script, you know. As long as you don't, sir. So, uh, to to in heat, is there a shadow character? Is that the one where they? That's not the face swap one, is it? Oh, well, one's a cop, and one's one's a baddie, isn't it? So I suppose the cop is the hero, is he? And then is Pacino is the is the mafia guy? No, no, no. Pacino, Pacino is a cop. Oh, Pacino's the yeah, and De Niro is a, just a brilliant film and, and, and goes against some of those elements to some extent because he's the absolute straight on cop. He's the goodie. De Niro is the person who does heists and yeah. quite, and he does them quite nastily. So he's a baddie. Yeah. But he, but he is such a human character and wants to kind of give up. That you feel sad in the end that he gets embroiled and and doesn't and doesn't get away with quitting. Yeah, well, those are the best. Yeah, those are the best um, hero, uh, best shadows, antagonists, as ones where you feel some empathy to them, for, for empathy for them. You sort of understand the situation they're in, and you sort of want them to lose, but maybe not as much as you first thought, or you you know. Because um, so you were saying thing. you were saying about the early scenes, because that's the classic early scene when Pacino meets De Niro in a cafe, and and they talk about each other, talk talk to each other, and there's yeah, a I've famous seen, scene, um, yeah, where you come yeah. across where they where basically Pacino says, "If I've got to kill you, I don't want to. I like you. I don't want to kill you, but I will do it." And De Niro does ditto back. So there's a it, there's a kind of there's a kind of buddy bromance going on. Yeah, there's yeah, a mutual well. respect. Yeah, yeah, and you don't. And I guess if it's if you know when you see the your opposites, you know you you can you know they complete you. So you might want to remove the opposite of you, but also you realise that together actually you're a more uniform entity. Well, it's interesting because Piccino knows he's empty without. In fact, yeah. he moves away from a relationship because he knows yeah, he, has yeah. to, he has to have a, someone to, to nick, basically. Yeah. He and has no, those... no existence otherwise. Yeah, he, man, a skeletal, you know. <laughs> they, they want, you know, or they have, one has to exist. They both have to exist or both can't exist. Yeah, one, one needs the other. Yeah, we, all have, we can't get rid of our shadow, you know. Yeah, no, that's a really good one. Yeah, that's a good film, that one. No, uh, yeah. Are, are these archetypes uh, all necessary for a good story? I mean, or elements of them? Or can you sort of get rid of some? 
Yeah, so I guess the cop out answer is because there's different lists, you could just say <laughs> my film, my story has this list, so I'm OK. But of course, there are no rules. So you can just, you know, you don't have to use them. But I think, you know, we talked, haven't we, about how stories are so ingrained that, you know, we, we are almost subconsciously expecting some of these character archetypes to appear. Now, you don't have to put them in, but it's really, firstly, it's really hard not to because we're hardwired, whether it's because that's the way our brains have been hardwired, just, just like we're sort of scared of heights or cats are scared of cucumbers, you know, or whether it's because we've just watched so many stories or had so many stories read to us and seen so much, we just expect to see these character archetypes. It could probably be a bit of both. So you don't have to have them. And I said, you could, if you leave out the mentor, you make it more difficult for the hero. And that's still quite rewarding to watch or to read or listen to. But yeah, and you can, you know, you say the Herald seems a little bit old fashioned, but then you know, look at R2-D2 with a hologram, you know, uh, was it yeah. help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. I mean, that's really, how, how fresh is that to make the Herald a hologram stuck in a robot? Yeah. Yeah. So it can be your friend too, you know. Um, and also, um, are cats really afraid of cucumbers? <laughs> well, what, having seen all the videos, it definitely seems that way. Okay. I think it's obviously they're obviously afraid of snakes, aren't they? That's obviously hardwired in to their DNA, and I guess they they got they get confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. But Merlin, just just a reflection yeah. on the archetypes. I mean, it's interesting. I think you're absolutely Thank right. You should uh, eat cucumber. I think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, the um the it's absolutely clear that if you want a driving plot, you have to early on have a shadow who you who the audience wants defeated, and they don't mind as in Chinatown a little bit of dark at the end where you don't. But yeah. during the film, you want Nicholson to succeed because you you you've grown to not like that character who's the shadow. Yeah, yeah. But but I suppose there's so many films where people, I mean, you could call them arty films. I don't know. Art house films tend to absolutely not have anything as, as clear as that as a dynamic, and um, so they'll 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 make a whole film without anything. I mean, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I gather the father, which is film with. Um, um, well, what's his face? God, Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins yeah, is about a guy with dementia, and it's a brilliant, apparently meant to be a brilliant film because it gets you in the head of someone who has dementia. So it's a kind of an intriguing and scary film. But of course, that that doesn't have any antagonists or anything. But it might be an incredibly compelling. Ooh, film. Yeah, but the, the antagonist have to be human. Well, ah, uh, yes, Elf him. Diamonds, that, that was the be... that, yeah, that was the point I was trying to get to right. because. Yes, because you're absolutely right. In the end, there's someone always fighting something. I, 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 there is a hero journey. There is a, there is a journey. But quite often, it is their, their own weakness or their own struggle. And the world around is, is not doing anything terrible to them, but they're fighting it. Yeah, um, but is, it, is dementia not his antagonist? Well, yeah, absolutely. But what I'm meaning is that you get a bit more subtle in, in, in other films. Uh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But, but, but the point about it is if you want to make a mainstream film that gets the largest audience up and wanting to watch it, you have to have a real antagonist, probably just to drive the plot along. It just, yeah, and I think, yeah, it just simplifies things. But it doesn't mean you have to do it. It doesn't mean you have to do it. But I would, I think people generally, you know, people who are advising people on, you know, new, newbies, you're right, if you make it a person, or something like a shark or a monster, it does it does make it easier to write the story. You know, if you if you're, if, if if the father is if the baddie is dementia, you know, you've got to be a pretty talented writer to 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 pull that off, which obviously they are. You know, but if the if the antagonist is non-human, then it, it, it's going to add some originality to it, I imagine. Yeah, I yeah, alien shark, you know. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Jaws, you know, uh, Volcanoes. Green, isn't, isn't the Greenland film with Joel Butler that's on Netflix? That's a last meteor. Week? Yeah. It's a meteor, okay. Bar, but, bar, but they're antagonists in the story because uh, the, the kid is stolen by 
a nasty person oh, who okay. to try and escape by using the kid. So oh, they so still the is just the inciting incident. Yeah, they still bring in they still bring in human beings acting in a bad yeah. way. Yeah, I think typically in disaster movies, you've always got the baddie as well, haven't you? As well as the natural disaster or the towering inferno or whatever it might be. Yes, it's always the selfish always one, isn't humans. it? Who, uh, who, yeah. The selfish one who goes to the lifeboat before anyone else. Mm. Yeah, it's sort of, I think also, you know, it's hard to have those great dialogue scenes with a shark or, a, <laughs> you know, a volcano. I mean, Jaws does it very well because they, they, they have sort of dialogue right up until the end. And actually, I think even the end, he's talking to himself, isn't he, when he's lining up the, the shot? Well, you the, the classic thing is, you, I suppose you want the audience to be wanting the revenge. They'll be wanting something to happen. And I don't actually want the shark to die, even while I was watching it. Because I didn't, I didn't feel actually bad for the shark. I thought he was just eating because he felt like it. <laughs> yes, classic Mark, yeah, he's sympathising with the shark. Well, that's again, that's great story writing to make somebody think, oh, poor old shark, just doing what comes naturally. <laughs> I, I, I think Mark's absolutely right there. I yeah, mean, yeah, I think the he probably problem is. He's actually just getting the authorities to deal with the problem in a yeah. sensible way. They're the bad Rather than yeah. ignoring it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, I mean, the shark doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. He's thinking he's being constantly harassed all the time and all he wants is breakfast. And, and in fact, the dynamic in Jaws is finally waiting for the moment where the mayor has to suddenly get his comeuppance. I mean, mm. that's the driving force on that film in many respects. Yeah. 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 yeah, although the mayor sort of is like a cl classic... Yeah, sort of, it's sort of oil washes, you know, water washes off his back, doesn't it? He sort it's, of... it's the same in Ghostbusters, isn't mm -hmm. it? When, when it's the person who's that slimy guy um, who gets his comeuppance as well because he's saying there aren't any ghosts, etc., etc. Yeah. And he finally has to admit it. I think we all, I mean, we all hate gatekeepers, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, every time we have to queue up for something, it's like, oh, flip <laughs> just let me get in in fact that's the reason why they're so successful because it's it's the only bit of authority that most human beings ever see yeah 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 that's true that's probably why they've they like you say they still they still are used yeah yeah good point yeah good point any other question oh, i think it's a, oh, actually I've got a bit more to go yes a little few more slides to go graham has um, a question graham said who who is who in the day of the jackal if you haven't spotted oh there. i've not seen that for a long time if that's homework. Well, the, um, the the hero is the antagonist, isn't he, in the, the Jackal, isn't he? Kind of. Yeah, um, anyway, I've not seen that. So to recap, um, yeah, so stories that follow the hero's gen journey, and even though some that don't tend to use character archetypes, uh, we see some examples in popular films. How can this knowledge help us? Well, um, you know, when writing our own story, we can assign the character architects, archetypes to the individuals, individual characters in our story to help flesh them out or add more. We can use the associated attributes and all these sort of graphs you find all over the internet to help guide the role of them in the story and you know, how they behave. Um, or we can start. We can start from a blank sheet and just create characters based on the character archetypes. So a bit like the question Mark you were saying is: Do all stories have to do? To have them you could just start with character archetypes i mean you can't really separate your main character or characters from the story but you could decide a world i suppose and then decide you know like the character archetypes in this chart you know who they might be if it was a school so if it was a school or butlins you know you could you could create a what's called in story world a precinct a precinct it's not just a police precinct. Precinct is a sort of shorthand in the film and TV industry for it, really TV industry for any location, you know, for soaps, you know, ER, casualty, you know, the hospital would be the precinct. So you could think about creating a precinct, a world, and then having all those sort of character archetypes in that world. So what would an artist be in a world with no, no dialogue or, or people were twice the height? You could just come up with your own, but it's, you know, but it's oh. more, I would say it's more best used as a guide or for watching and, and being interested in filmmaking. Um, how do you keep it fresh? You know, how do you, how do you not have 
the Gandalf character in your story. Well, we talked about this. You can leave some out, so just don't have them in at all. You could subvert expectations, so a bit like we saw with Terminator 2, make the mentor, you know, a young boy. Or I don't know if you've seen a Russian doll. So in Russian doll, uh, I think it was written by women, I think, or direct, anyways, a mostly female cast, I think. And what they did is they they took traditional female archetypes that we would see, we'd almost probably class as stereotypes, and they and they had men play those characters. And so uh, yes, it's sort of if you watch the show. For most people, I don't think it's obvious that's what they've done. But when you realise that's what they've done, it's quite quite refreshing to see how all these characters that used to normally be played by women, you know, female actors, are played by male actors. Like the mother figure is actually played by, or the ex-wife is actually played by a man. You can mix it up. So Atticus Finch in the uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is several archetypes and he probably, you know, he's the father, which is another one that I didn't talk about, the hero, and there's also one called the idealist. He's actually a mixture, all three, or perhaps, I don't know the story well enough, perhaps he plays each one of those uh, character archetypes in different parts of the story. That's usually more likely. What? There's more? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not gonna, don't worry. There's no, I'm not going to cover this tonight. Um, but there's more than just character archetypes. You have symbolic archetypes. So think about colours or elements or shapes. You know, light is sort of hope. Maybe not in the twi and maybe not in poltergeist, but normally light is hope. You can always think of exceptions, of course. Green is normally growth, except perhaps when it's mould. <laughs> Setting archetypes. We think of caves as being dangerous. Forests are often dangerous. Islands often, you know, represent isolation. I uh, remember when Tom Hanks was stuck on that island, you know, about isolation usually. Or you know, Life of Pi, when the little boat in the big sea, you know, it's dangerous, isolated. And the you know, tiger. <laughs> Which one? Which one, Sue? And he had a tiger in the boat. Yes, yes, good point. So lots of, yeah, lots of obstacles. Um, object archetypes. You know, objects can have certain meaning. Keys, we think of discovery, you know, to open a door or a locker or a chest. Um, you know, I guess those like treasure maps, you know, maps we sort of associate with finding something interesting. Uh, rings tend to be associated with devotion, possibly power you know, in the super superhero world, a little bit more than just devotion. Well, so yeah, so there's another three talks for you there, Graham. Um, but to summarize, yeah, so we've defined character archetypes and seen a selection of the most popular. We've seen examples where they've been used in cinema with a range of mostly bloodless examples. Uh, we thought about how we can use them to help us write stories. And we thought about how we can keep it fresh and not use stereotypes. We've learned that archetypes play a role in, in more than just uh, characters. And I think that's me done. Very good. Any questions? Thanks, Alan. Extremely good. Thank you. Very wow. thought provoking and uh, like, like all the best talks, so bloody obvious once you've given yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Until you've done it. Um, I, I, the first thing that got to me is I, I always think of or had thought of archetypes and stereotypes as very much the same sort of thing. But I, know, I think you hit the nail on the head just before the break there, where you said that you, it took a while for you to understand that, you know, the hero is not black and white. You know, people don't necessarily fit into these pigeonholes. And I suspect that it's where they do fit into the pigeonholes that they start to become stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing I've noticed, yeah, as you say, they, it's, it's where it's so obvious that it becomes frustrating. I mean, of course, you know, once once, you know, you've you've you know, you start to think about stories critically. I mean, it's hard to do that because if you're watching a good film, you get swept away in it. I get swept away in it and you stop analysing it. But of course, you know, you can read scripts and you can spot certain things. What's quite interesting to also notice if you're watching ensemble pieces, what they tend to do now, which I find really interesting, is I think because they know that a lot of these series are really long, they make they they have the everyman character come into this extraordinary world. If you watch Succession or something like that, and then you'll see the everyman or a madman. Have people seen Madman? 
So you, the, you know, it's the it's the secretary who starts off as you know the lowest rung in the ladder of the advertising firm, and she goes right to the top. And of course, what you want in all your stories is growth. You want to see your hero, your protagonist change. And of course, if we're just shooting a five minute you know short film, they don't have very far to go. Often they only do one act, but if they do three acts, they can't change that much. But you know, all these TV series like Mad Men or is it supernatural is like 12 series unless you're just going to go like this which you can do like if it's a soap you just need that breath so breaking bad you know he's got to go from mr chips <laughs> you know to don corleone or in every and obviously if you watch have you anyone watched succession it's brilliant you know it's it's uh you can you can spot it now you can see that the character who is the most hopeless is the most unlike everyone else you just know, oh, he's going to become the hero by the end. You can just start to spot it. And I find that really satisfying. And I find it really pleasurable to go, oh, I spotted what they're doing. And then I can enjoy him slowly working his way up to the top. <laughs> you know. going, going, going back to the, the classic one, I mean, the police yeah. model is the absolute classic one, isn't it? The, the tough... The rookie, as you as you were saying earlier, yeah, the, yeah. The, the rookie the person who's not taken seriously or whatever, and then the rough abrasive boss. A training but, day. The archetypes have been so played out over the years. It must be really difficult, I would have thought, for anyone writing a police script anymore, not to come up with a stereotype to some extent, because in the end, you will now have going back to the old stereotypes because that's no longer the stereotype anymore, if you sort of mean, uh, because no one dares do the, the boss who shouts you down anymore. Um, but I think you, you did it. You you, I, I agree with you. And I think what they will probably do is they play around with form. So like, was it, was it um, the thin blue line with Rowan Atkinson or Brooklyn 99? So you make it a comedy yeah. or you make it you know, you make it supernatural, Wellington supernatural, you know, about, or Mulder and Scully, you, you just twist it. So well, I think, I, I, think, yeah, I, think line of, I think Line of Duty is a, the perfect example of that twist, because essentially it's all about who, those of you who follow it, it, it is the main man a baddie or not. Then we've taken yeah. seven series to get to this point and still people don't know. I mean, that's quite a feat. Well, isn't in every series there's one really senior bad bent copper yeah. it's all about whether they can catch him so it's a bit like um colombo isn't it a bit like colombo but but the main character uh, who i've forgotten the, the actor's name but don't know who who coincidentally has a name that's exactly the same name as the mr big and and it's almost like they, they're saying no i can't believe it are you actually honestly going to say it's this, this is the main mr big and he's all the way through. It's the underlying story all throughout yeah, well, the series. Yeah, so that's, that's a clever twist. Clever. And again, it's also, like we said, the clever thing of Jed Mercurio was he made the character that goes, the, the, new, the newest character is the protagonist. It's the young chap, isn't it? What's he's called? The Scottish chap, with the short black hair. Yeah. And of course, they bring him in as the newbie. And then, of course, that means Jed Mercurio can get a hundred seasons off the BBC because <laughs> he could just keep him going very slowly up the career path. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. It, it no. won't stop, will it? I mean, they, they, why should they? No, but I thought, I, I thought every series they had one bad, bad copper. Is that oh, well, they, they, oh, yeah, well, that's the, that's the plot. There's always right. a bad copper because it's an internal corruption. Yeah. yeah. But the underlying story that runs all the way through is there's a big, big, big bad copper. Oh, okay. And is it, yeah. is it the main man? Um, H. H, that's yeah. it. They must have decided to do that because they, he must have decided we're getting so many series, he had to add another layer of complexity. That yeah, probably. Be my, my guess, yeah. my guess. Anyway, very good. Uh, any other questions, guys? Yeah, one thing occurs to me, uh, Merlin. Yeah. I, I don't know, you've obviously put an enormous amount of thought and work into all this um i don't it's not your profession really is it but uh, I, I wondered why you were so interested that uh, what drove you on to research all this material yes so i find 
I don't know about, I'm sure it's the same for most of us, that, that um, I can learn a lot from, you know, reading books or watching lectures or going to workshops, but there's nothing like actually having to do a presentation on it <laughs> or doing an essay on it to really help you under, see if you understand it or put it back into your brain one more time. Yeah. So that's probably why I did it or enjoy doing it. And but, I think, but, you know. but you go to quite a few courses, don't you, Merlin? Yeah, so yeah, it, I've it, done. Shows, it shows your, your view of honing a, um, a hobby skill yeah. is to actually treat it quite professionally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you know, some of you know, I'm trying to get short films funded and, you know, write feature length films, try and get an agent next the end of this year or next year, you know, try and get feature films made. So that is my intention. So, I feel maybe not necessarily that I have to learn a craft because I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to do an MA in screenwriting or creative writing. So I'm learning by reading books, going to courses and then, you know, producing these presentations, you know. Yeah. Great. Are there any other? Yeah. Um, can I butt in? Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah. Um, on the character front, um... oh. and then he was gone. Then he's gone. <laughs> so we just guess what Graham was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Graham, muted, Graham. muted. I should I should turn your video off and your microphone back on, Graham. You, you can see why Graham doesn't chair meetings. Yeah, <laughs> it's still muted, Graham. Then we can't see you. Right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Right. right. Um, sorry, I re-entered, so I was muted again. Yeah. So I um the, you've got in you've got the archetype characters, but each yeah. of those characters have an actual personality. Yeah. Don't they? So is that the next stage? So uh for example, in the Wizard of Oz gatekeeper, yeah, there was a sort of humorous character. Yeah. Um, but that could have been a completely different personality. Yes, I suppose they would still be aggressive or um yes. Um, yes. So, 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 so the the, lay, the characters are not just the archetype characters, they're also the, the, the there is the actual sort of normal characteristics of that person of making them a particular characteristic. And and it's sometimes quite difficult to convey that in a um script. I mean, I know by own experience we wanted to have a character once who was boring. So how do you write somebody who's boring? Um, deliberately, you know, you actually wanted the person to appear boring. Um, so it, it, things like that. It's it, it, it's that sort of actually writing the, the sort of actual individual character. Um, I mean, I was. I think probably any of those character archetypes could be boring. I yes, maybe the trickster them boring. Can be how boring. to make them boring or to make them interesting or or, yeah. or um the opposite of boring. Yeah, I guess we probably just think of the character archetypes have a function. So yeah, the they have a function in the story structure, but it's the yeah. actual um then it's the implementation to make them actually interesting people in their own right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, I'm not saying I'm not saying I've given you I'm not saying I'm making oh, no, it I'm not, making I'm not it really easy. You were trying to. I'm just saying it, it seems to be like there's another stage yet. Yes. You know, yes. In terms of actually, and also, presumably, um, you want to try and uh, you can have all these functions, but the danger is, from my experience, is you can end up everybody seeming a bit the same um, because you you sort of think the same way yourself. Um, so you've got to sort of say, this person is completely different from that person. Yeah. So the, ca you're right, the, the character, of these yeah, the character archetypes, I agree with you, they're only a starting point, yes. they give them a function, but then right, to make characters appear different from each other, well, we obviously can use the physical and non-physical attributes, we can use how they think about relationships, there's lots of methods you can do, you can do the boring methods, which I hate, it's where you have like a hundred questions you ask them, like age, height, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, the sort of character descriptions, like a, like a policeman might record somebody. But then there's other questions you can ask them, like what's your first memory? 
you know, what do you think about uh, in terms of your favorite holiday? You can ask more esoteric questions without, you know, with, with more longer answers. You can ask things like, what would this character have in their pocket? You can do things like, um, you know, obviously you need to try and make them sound different and there's tricks you can do with that. You know, base them on somebody you know, that's a nice idea. So pick up tweaks, uh, tw you know, um, not tweaks, you know, characteristics for somebody you know, maybe the way they fidget or whether they, they always say basically or basically, you know, the way that they speak in short sentences or long sentences. Women tend to speak in longer sentences. They often finish with a question. So that's another trick you can do to make gender differences. I agree, it's not easy. And I'm not, and I, you know, I have seen bunch, all these things I'm telling you are just from workshops I've been on or books that I've read. Um, Tim, probably, I'm sure Tim, you probably listen to how people speak and watch how people behave, maybe? Absolutely, yeah, that's part of the ingredients in creating a character. I was just thinking, um, Graham, why would you want boring characters? Because you want to contrast them with other interesting characters. Okay, but I think, to my mind, the only way you can get away with a boring, boring character is right. to oh, well, Right, okay, I can tell you the, I'll tell you the exact, I'll tell you the exact example, because then people can have a look at it if they want. Yeah. It's when we were making the film Clarkson, which is going back a bit now, mm -hmm. but it's on the club website, and there's a, there's a, there's a character in that called Gandhi. Oh. Now, um, we had some problems with the, um, the, the performance on that, um, in that he was meant to be a know-all bore who, who, who was telling the um, telling um, Clarkson, our hero, um, the obvious, as far as Clarkson was concerned, because he knew it all already. Um, but obviously he was also providing exposition to the audience. So he was, so he had a, had a dual role. Um, now, the actor was very good, stage actor, and he did it very well as a stage performance. And then we said, as you usually do with film, oh, we must tone it down, tone it down, tone it down. And of course, when we toned it down, he fell out of character. You can see the results in the finished uh, film, which is on the website. Um, uh, it's, it's Mr. Gandhi is the name of the character. Um, and, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and, 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 and it's things like that, where you want somebody we wanted him to contrast with the, the, the other characters because we had different characters. We had the, we, you know, we had different range of characters in the whole film. And so I think that he was the boring one. I think, I think what, what you're interpreting as boring is that uh, to my mind, uh, I, 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 we dis we've discussed this before and I think I watched him and I think I disagreed with you at the time, whether or not he actually was boring. Um, I think the danger is if you keep turning actors to tone it down and tone it down, you, you will get rid of the character because there's nothing there, you know, you squeeze yeah, that, 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 That's the problem with film acting. That, 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 yeah. That's the, that, that, uh, that. It's, it's not you watch the series. Honing it down, the it's series, more of internalizing it, I think. Yes, yeah. If you watch the series Afterlife, as an example, there's, um, I don't know if you've seen that with the Ricky Gervais yeah. um, vehicle. Um, there's um, a character the postman, who works isn't in he? the journal. Jur there's a number of characters. That, yeah. uh, there's a character that works in the journalist's um, office with him um, who plays someone who Ricky Gervais finds incredibly boring. And we see it through Ricky's eyes. This character is incredibly boring. But actually, it doesn't mean that the character himself has to be boring in what he says and what he does. And I think, you know, he's, he's actually quite intriguing in a way. He's unusual, he's bizarre, which, is, which are not boring characteristics at all. Even though Ricky Gervais, and we see, as we see through Ricky Gervais's eyes, we see him as boring. So that's one way um, of illustrating that kind of character. It's interesting, that, Oliver. I, 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 is, isn't there one who keeps on coming with completely non-stories? Um, oh, there's, yeah, there's him. As yeah, well. There's him as well. In fact, yeah, I think he... In fact, that device, I suppose Ricky Gervais finds multiple characters in that device boring, probably because in real life, Ricky Gervais finds everybody else boring apart from himself. So he's written lots of characters in yeah. his sitcom. But, 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 but I agree with, with, with Tim's nuance here. I think it, it is that if you did the classic, think of them as a character, then they have a need and then they have a want and they have a need. Everyone has a want and a need. And if you start exploring that, you can bring some humanity to that pedantic person. I don't know. They, they may be pedantic in the story. They may do all of those things. But I suppose as an actor, Tim, 
an actor would have to think, who is this person? Yeah. And then if the writer can kind of help that in some small way, uh, then, <clears throat> then the person becomes, I mean, no one should be boring as such. Yeah. Someone should be slowing the storyline down, perhaps. But, but they're all human beings. Um, I think, you know, Mr. Bean, for some reason, um, he's a very uh, he's a very boring character, isn't he? Yeah. Except that he's incredibly funny, uh, as played obviously by uh, Rowan Atkinson. Yeah. I, I think, as described, um, the the problem Graham had um, is that you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Graham, but you said that the character needed to speak these parts um, because it was necessary for the exposition. And yes. there he was acting set... as Harold as well in some degree. Yes. Right. Yeah. OK, fair enough. But there, there you've, you've landed yourself with a massive problem because you, you, you need to engage the audience. If you're going to give the exposition, well, you need to engage uh, the audience. And, and well, one reason for doing this that's... is that is that you we had to explain stuff to the audience. Yeah. Which the hero already knew. Oh, I, I understand so, it. So that, that was the scenario. So the, yeah. so, so the problem was, is that you then end up with a situation, how do you make that scene interesting? Mm. Because we have to come out with these facts cool. to yeah. make it clear to the audience. But the hero himself is clearly, obviously, knew this already. So therefore, he, 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 must, he must be irritated by this blow, yes. Yeah, I, I, pre I understand the problem entirely. I, I, think, I, 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 think that was a, I think it was a rather neat way of doing it, Graham, in the end, because the one thing I absolutely loathe in all historical dramas is the exposition. Mm. Um, well, and it's almost like almost every historical drama is a nightmare if you, if you have well, a half an idea about the history behind it. It just seems awful. But I find I find that, that that's a problem with wider than just historical dramas. It also applies to ordinary ones as well. Sometimes any film, the Harold character can be really difficult because they're, they're the one who actually sets the scene in a way. Can well, the ma the, 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 Matrix, the Matrix is a perfect example. They have to keep on explaining what the hell was going on in the later films because they realise that people just were getting lost. I mean, yeah. Can you avoid obvious exposition? It seems to me that the best films don't just start off by giving a whole load of exposition. The worst ones do, in some respects, perhaps with the exception of Star Wars. But um, a, a lot of the best films, they just squeeze, they ease, they ooze yes. the exposition. It's got, it's got to be subtle. I mean, I think it, it's kind of interesting because I'm on a film writing course at the moment. And so I, 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 I gave my outline out to the course tutor um, uh, who's an experienced script editor. And what's fascinating is she misunderstood quite a lot of things that I really thought were obvious nuances, right down to the fact that the character, which I antic anticipate you playing, Tim, <laughs> um, basically, uh, she thought killed himself. And I thought, well, it's bloody obvious he's dying. She's, he's popping pills, he's doing... You know, and it's really interesting that there's, there's this grey area where you have to keep the audience on your side, but don't say too much. And I think it's a real art, I suspect, in, in your writing. There must be, some people might write it or film it and then go, okay, guys, have I, have I said too much now? And then, it, and then they edit it out. I presume that's how it works. I think that well, the trick is sometimes you just try and hide it. So in that Chinatown scene, you hide it in the, in the meal. So the exposition is within the meal. Or in you know another 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 heat, like you said, they're basically having a meal. So that's one way you can do it. Of course, Star Wars just shoved it on the screen at the front. <laughs> well, that was quite original then. <laughs> I didn't like that particularly. I must admit, I don't want to start reading it when I begin a film. On the whole, um, but yeah, I do, with I, you, Mark, I, totally agree. <laughs> I, I think I think the redeeming features, the other redeeming features of the film, sort of um, excuse that, didn't they? I mean, I hadn't, I don't think I've seen that quite so obviously before or since that kind of exposition. Sci-fi, sci perhaps a bit more so. I think in Blade Run, even twenty forty nine, they felt they had to do a little bit. Mm. Sometimes it's it's done sort of for effect. If you think of the Sixth Sense you know, where there's a twist and they, they take you back and they, they re-show you things that happened and they sort of explain the twist as they take you through, as you see it through, 
you know, in a different in a different way. And that if that's done well, that can be really enjoyable um, for the viewer to watch. Essentially, you do the sixth sense because I saw it without anybody around, so I didn't have a chat with anyone, and I didn't get it until right at the end and I still didn't get it so I had to ask a complete stranger as I went out in the <laughs> cinema is that what happened here and it must be weird when this person accosted them so obviously it was done subtly enough Oliver that I, I didn't even spot it particularly well you know so didn't he say I see dead people or something wasn't that um well yeah yeah well i'm yeah and so i see you i mean it's it's bloody obvious when when it's pointed out like that tim yeah mm. but i but i didn't really get it in the midst of it all um no I'm so, i must have i don't think i got it that quickly no me neither but, they, but, but but it's an interesting issue because the the, the the conversation i was having with a few people about this in, in a little confab was i didn't mind that people didn't quite know what was going on because i thought that was what a good film should be about but it was almost like everyone was saying, it's not clear enough, it's not clear enough. And I was thinking, yeah. isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that a good film when it's not clear enough? Yeah, it should always be one step ahead of the audience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think The Sixth Sense worked pretty well on a number of levels, because if you could, fight, you could work it out at different stages and still get enjoyment, enjoyment from it. Um, mm. I think I didn't work it out super early, but there was a point in the film where I almost got got bored enough to, to actually for my brain to go I wonder what the twist would be if there was a twist and as soon as my brain went uh, into that I sort of suddenly it, you know it, it twigged but uh, I still enjoyed the rest of the film even though it wasn't the very end. Merlin just a, a thought going yeah. back to exactly what we're doing is, is, is presumably the intriguing thing is to map what you've just been talking about today with the hero's <laughs> journey isn't it because the I presume people have said, right, here's the hero's journey and here are all of those archetypes along the way. Yeah. And I think we talked, didn't we, about how the mentor often is at the beginning and the heralds often at the beginning. I think when I did the hero's journey, I think I only mentioned the, the, men, the mentor, I think. But yeah, you could do another talk on the hero's journey and come up with a, use a film or come up with a story where all those character archetypes appear. So classically, the gatekeeper would be the person in the second act. Well, who, the first who, or who second stops act the or thing happening. Or third. Yeah, maybe stops the thing happening. Is that it'll be at the act breaks, the gatekeeper, yeah, acting mm. as a sort of barrier from one place so, to another. So, so plan A doesn't work because the gatekeeper's blocked it. So you have to do another plan. Well, I suppose in Act One to Act Two, well, actually in both breakpoints, the gatekeeper would never su succeed in stopping the hero. Because obviously the story would end, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. So they always they just delay things rather than yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure again there's always exceptions, but yeah, generally they get past the gatekeeper. You know, think about all those films with bouncers. You know, and those they either beat them up <laughs> or have fake ID or they go around the back. <laughs> or they go through the roof. You know, there's always some little trick, isn't there? You know. So yeah, so that's that's the challenge as writers, you know, is to come up with fresh ways, you know, to solve Graham's problem. How do you make, how do you make someone who has to play one of those roles interesting, or how do you hide exposition, you know, how do you get, yeah, how do you make the message delivery interesting? Yeah, it was also we're trying to contrast it with other characters. So we had some interesting people. So it wasn't the case of. Um, you can make them interesting to make them an interesting person because that they would sort of be you just have everybody as a rather interesting person somehow. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I have to say I agree with the nice people in it as well. You know, the characters they meant to be anyway. Yeah. But I sort of agree with Tim. They all your characters should be interesting. Yes. Yeah, all right. They should all have their objectives and their wants and their behaviours. And then yeah. if they're boring, it's because they're like I think who said it was they're boring to the the point of view protagonist. So they're basically irritating him, you know, yeah, irritating well, him. That's what we were trying to do, yes, irritate the protagonist. And we were also, we, we also had, we had some other people who, who, who filled other character roles. So in a sense, so we couldn't have everybody the same. Yeah, but so, surely so in someone like the everyman character, his objective might just be to get through the scene without getting killed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And 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 they, and and they, that mirrors the audience, doesn't it? Because they yeah. just they just if it's really excruciating, they just want to just finish the film, you know, 
this deliciousness of going, oh, no, God, no, don't go through that door. You know, because the everyman's saying, don't go through that door as well, presumably. I mean, Does anyone watch the uh, Big Bang Theory? Yeah, I watch it. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that Penny could be the everyone. Yeah, she definitely is. Because yeah. they've got these four people that talk about stuff that she doesn't understand and she asks them or she makes fun of them. What's what's super colliding, whatever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a very clever approach, isn't it? Because she gets lured into their world and yeah. she shouldn't be. Yeah. 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 She's, so again, that's just being fresh, isn't it? Rather than having, so she's basically, you know, she's the every every woman, every man, and she's she's with all these superheroes because they're all super physicists, you know. Um, so that's a clever one. I'm sure there's others. I'm sure there's others. I think we just to say thank you again. Oh, thanks Berlin. very much. Yeah. It's really, really good stuff. Really Thank good you. stuff. Thank you, and, um, Thanks for listening. Good stuff, guys. Thanks a lot. Nice yeah, to see you all again. Thank you, see you, Thank you all very much. Thanks to the banana. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Merlin, and thank you, Mark. Yeah, cheers. cheers.